Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. Like in many areas of innovation, the history of robot-assisted surgery can be portrayed through an examination of seminal moments. Take 1983 and the development of the Arthrobot Surgical Robot, or take 1985 when the Puma 560 robotic surgical arm was used for the first time in a neurosurgical biopsy. Fifteen years later, in 2000, the FDA approved its first robotic surgery system, the Da Vinci, for general laparoscopic surgery. Perhaps an even better gauge of progress is the willingness turned eagerness for physicians to trust vision-guided systems in the operating room. Today, that dynamic is stronger than ever. In this episode of All Things Photonics, we embark on our own in-depth look at vision-guided and surgical robots. We start in the present with Moshi Safran, CEO of RSIP Vision USA, a developer of custom computer vision for medical devices and applications. The company is active at both the planning stage and interventional stage, providing software solutions for robotic surgery systems to support automated planning and recommendation. Later, we speak with Russell Taylor, professor of computer science at Johns Hopkins University. In his more than 40 years in the field, Taylor says the three-pillared foundation of surgical robotics remains unchanged, a synergy between humans, technology, and information to improve treatment. Within this three-way partnership, advances to imaging devices have caused meaningful disruption in the field. It is here in photoacoustic imaging, optical coherence tomography, confocal microscopy, and other modalities that we see photonics shine through. Here's Jake Saltzman with CEO of RSIP Vision, Moshi Safran. You know, what has been the typical path that an AI healthcare application has taken uh, or a robot guided procedure to go from concept to reality? What has to happen? What are the check marks along the way to get this from concept to reality and into the hands of the right people? So I'll talk a little bit about RSIP Vision first. We're a, a software company, right? We provide the foundational computer vision and AI technologies and solutions, and those pieces of software plug in to a medical device, to a robotic surgery system, or to a medical device system, uh, whether it's at the planning stage or uh, interventional. We uh, are active mainly in two main fields. The first one is orthopedics. So in orthopedics, we're doing a lot of work in automated planning, for instance, uh, using 2D x-rays to provide a 3D model of the anatomy and providing that to the surgeon, and then going beyond that to the next steps of the surgical plan. So uh, automatically recommending a uh, same implant for a joint replacement or automatically providing uh, some sort of analytics or, or uh, recommendations uh, for which type of procedure the surgeon should select. Uh, the other field where we're uh, working uh, very intensively is in intraoperative assessment tools. So here again, for example, measuring the outcome or the expected outcome of a surgery, say of a joint replacement, while that's happening using intraoperative imaging, comparing that to the preoperative imaging, and then uh, providing real-time feedback to the surgeon to uh, achieve optimal and accurate results. Now, now regarding the pathway, so as I said, the, the pathway uh, to the OR for these technologies was always long in the era before AI, where you could only do fairly simplistic things and, and you could only provide uh, uh, capabilities in a very controlled environment. It remains uh, so. Uh, the stages are the same. So first, you need to prove that the algorithm works on some uh, a data set. It needs to work offline. You need to measure that you're successful on an offline data set. And that's only the first step. The next step is preclinical validation, whether it's in animals uh, or in cadavers, and then first in human. This is a very long pathway that has always taken uh, a number of years and will still take years. Of course, it's shorter if you have a predicate device. It's shorter if you're just plugging in one feature to an existing uh, process. What what has changed? What what has really changed is more about the technological uh, feasibility of things. Right? In the past, there was only so much uh, you could do uh, in terms of uh, computerized analysis of the image. And, And today... The rule of thumb is that if a human can see it, if the surgeon is seeing this in the images consistently, and they could be measuring this manually, uh, then you can train an AI to do the same. And with enough data, the AI can do this faster than the surgeon. And of course, it can do it quantitatively. You can have you know, a model that the, the, the surgeon is manipulating. You can measure exactly 
uh, the angle, uh, say, of, of, uh, of the cup of a hip replacement uh, implant that's been introduced uh, into the patient. So you can do this, again, if you have enough data, you can do sort of whatever a surgeon could do if they had enough time uh, manually. You can automate this. Uh, you can uh, train it on data uh, that's been amassed from uh, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of cases and bake in all that knowledge. Uh, and you can do it uh, more reliably. So, so I think the main thing that's changed today is that the technological feasibility is less of a barrier. The problems are, are, are solvable in a way that they have not been in the past. In the past, if you wanted, say, to know where a bone you're seeing uh, in a CRM shot is in 3D, uh, during, uh, in a surgical situation, the algorithm just, it probably wouldn't work in many cases. And then you need uh, to have some sort of user interaction. Then the solution would start looking like something that is adding workload to the a surgeon rather than saving them time. What is the global healthcare community looking for now that we've evolved in the validation stage compared to maybe what it was looking for 10, 15, even five years ago? In surgical robotics, say soft tissue surgery, there's the big player, the 800 pound gorilla, uh, intuitive surgical, right? Their robot is already there, has been there for many years. Uh, and then there are those who are uh, going up against them. Either they're trying to go head to head against them and and develop a similar, uh, uh, say, robot, but to find some differentiator, or they're uh, developing uh, smaller robots for, uh, you know, the long tail or for other situations. But all of this, uh, this whole uh, surgical robotics uh, ecosystem, uh, where, uh, you know, competing with each other in some way, everybody's looking to be the first to integrate uh, uh, AI uh, into the OR. And one, one of the topics that comes up a lot is integrating uh, preoperative images into the intraoperative field. So if you have a, a patient who has uh, uh, undergone a, a CT or an MRI before the procedure, there's you know, full information there about the anatomy. Now, during the surgery itself, there's a camera in there. Maybe there's two cameras in there, but you don't see the full uh, depth of the anatomy. You don't see the full 3D representation uh, of the anatomy. So integrating that imaging into the surgical field is uh, sort of uh, sometimes considered the holy grail. Of, uh, of surgical robotics, especially for soft tissue surgery, where this is very uh, challenging technologically. Everybody's sort of racing uh, to do this. So this is uh, uh, one trend. And of course, there's a, a long list of features uh, beyond that, that that everybody's trying to develop. So uh, to, to measure uh, things in millimeters in, uh, say, a surgical uh, video, or sort of the ADAS uh, type of features, right? So we have driver assistance for, for the car, safety warnings, et cetera. And there are analogies in the robotic uh, surgery space and even in uh, laparoscopic surgery as well. In a quarter century of operation, RSIP vision has advanced as the fields of AI and computer vision have advanced. It's a chicken and egg situation, though, and the company today applies its solutions beyond the biomedical field. In the surgical robotic sector alone, the company's technology supports 3D measurement, calibration, and image reconstruction. In a field so multifaceted, advances in one area hold implications for many others. Innovations in AI and computer vision are quantifiable benchmarks of progress in and of themselves. How they are applied in a grander scheme, in clinical workflows, is where we begin to chart headway. So how are we charting progress in the field? Ten years ago or five years ago, I would say uh, I would have said that the progress is charted by the algorithmic uh, advances, right? So uh, progress is measured by uh, being able to solve computer vision problems that were not previously solvable. Now, today, I think my answer would be different. I think today I would say that we measure progress by uh, which solutions have, how far have solutions gotten uh, to actual clinical use. Progress is gauged by taking this technology and actually getting it through clinical milestones. So uh, actually bringing something to the level of stability uh, and, and understanding the way it should really be used uh, in the workflow to the level where it's uh, gone through a clinical trial or to the level where you actually have uh, an AI piece of software that is uh, uh, at the level of performance that actually lets it be used in uh, actual surgical planning. And when, when you're asking that question, uh, there's a much smaller number of examples. So that's really, uh, I think, the way that uh, I would gauge your progress today. Uh, less about uh, algorithmic or the technological or the computer vision uh, progress on the software side, and more on uh, taking those technologies and knowing where to apply it, where we're going to get a win, and where we're going to get something to a level where the users and uh, clinicians are actually going to be able to use it in the field and, uh, of course, get it approved by uh, the regulatory bodies, etc. When the Arthrobot, Da Vinci system, and other first-wave robot surgery systems burst onto the scene, they did so with a flash. 
Systems that were new really were new. Explaining their benefits to medical personnel was no small feat. Building trust was an even lengthier process. The benefits to robot-assisted surgery are tangible. Faster recovery times, higher precision, and minimal invasiveness. Even still, automation can seem foreign. Building trust in an automated system is a very human undertaking. You have companies like yourself who are on the R&D side, you have clinicians and medical personnel, and then you have patients in, in healthcare environments who are, on, I suppose, the receiving end of some of these surgeries. What are some mm-hmm. of the risks and the concerns with this technology as it is still a, a relatively new one in the grand scheme of things? So if you're trying to automate some aspect of a surgery, you really need to reach a very, very high level of reliability and stability that's going to convince, first of all, to convince the surgeons to trust the system enough. And, and in medicine, we have uh, less data than in you know, you know, the, the autonomous cars world where they can drive millions of miles and simulate them. We're, we're always going to have less data uh, for medicine. But if we say that with that analogy, trying to automate too much is considered risky. And even if you can show statistically that you're as good as a human or, or that you're, you're doing well, that doesn't mean people are going to trust it. Just like we uh, uh, measure it and do the, and do the math and, and show that autonomous cars are safer than human drivers, it doesn't mean that people are going to accept this uh, technology. It's still going to be considered risky because uh, we're, we're humans and, and definitely uh, physicians who have so much uh, experience and, and are working with the patients themselves, they want their hands on the control. So we flip the coin on its head. Another aspect we have in computer vision for uh, medical procedures is uh, precise measurements, right? So uh, a computer can provide a 3D model. That 3D model is, you can manipulate it on the screen, you can measure things there. It's uh, very compelling that this 3D model is more effective than anything a surgeon could imagine in their mind's eye. So if a surgeon has a choice between using an X-ray or using two X-rays and trying to imagine the 3D anatomy of the patient, or having a computer take those X-rays and show him a precise 3D model that he can rotate in in any way and see the anatomy himself, he's going to prefer that 3D model. So I think there's a a very strong innovation uh, ecosystem. There are many startups. There's, uh, you know, technology companies uh, like ourselves who are running uh, multiple initiatives. And then there's, you know, there's the existing uh, medical device uh, industry uh, with these uh, big players who are very strong uh, uh, on the clinical side. So the more connections there are between those two sides and the more uh, both the parts of this ecosystem are creative about uh, the business models that they can use to collaborate and to move faster, uh, the better we're going to be. So let's talk about what's going on. Uh, we'll get into RSIP vision uh, in a moment, but first uh, from the field in, in a broader sense, what applications are forthcoming in uh, robot assisted surgery in AI healthcare? So uh, we talked about a bunch of them, right? So again, in in ortho, uh, everybody's looking to enhance their uh, surgical planning. Everybody's looking to do some sort of navigation or some sort of assessment uh, uh, during the surgery, Uh, not necessarily with uh, robots, even in non-robotic use cases. Another uh, sort of up and coming aspect, I think, is the analytics uh, aspect. So uh, because, uh, you know, large amounts of data have been amassed, at least for certain uh, types of uh, uh, common surgeries, uh, there's a lot of information there that's still waiting to be tapped, right? So if you have 10,000 cases, you can use that to start uh, analyzing it and providing a recommendation, which types of patients should, uh, should really be sent to what type of uh, procedure or to what type of uh, device? Uh, how are the outcomes, uh, you know, influenced uh, by, by different decisions? So the whole issue of uh, clinical decision support, I think, is, uh, is an up-and-coming one. It's, uh, it's really just starting. RSIP Vision is deploying AI for image model reconstruction. 2D images turned 3D images offer medical personnel an added advantage inside and outside the OR. The range of applications are vast. So one of the uh, technologies we're very excited about is, uh, as I mentioned, 2D to 3D reconstruction. Right? So we're uh, using AI to reconstruct 3D models uh, right now of uh, bones in various joints, but uh, we're also looking at uh, other parts of the anatomy. So we're using AI to reconstruct these 3D models of particular parts of patient anatomy from 2D imaging, right? So the situation can be, and this is useful in many situations. Uh, In some situations, this can be an opportunity to reduce radiation, right? So instead of exposing a patient to a CT or or to a cone beam or whatever, maybe it's enough to take two shots or three shots or four four x-rays and get uh, a result that's just as useful for that particular procedure. In other cases, this is solving an operational problem or a reimbursement problem. So for certain uh, surgeries, there's no reimbursement for a CT, or it's hard to get reimbursement for a CT. But if a patient does 
have a CT or does have a 3D imaging, the surgeon can plan this uh, procedure much better. So uh, being able to reconstruct the 3D models from uh, 2D x-rays uh, is very uh, beneficial uh, for these patients and is solving a problem that there's probably not going to be any other way to solve. So as I said, for this technology we developed in-house uh, based on you know, experience in other computer vision problems. Uh, our first uh, application of this technology is in orthopedic space for knees, for hips, for shoulders. And we're also looking at applying this uh, to other parts of anatomy, to imaging that's taken uh, uh, with contrast. Uh, we're on to something that's uh, uh, pretty generally uh, applicable. Uh, so th this is one uh, a theme uh, we're very excited about. Another one I can mention is 2D to 3D registration. We just put out some uh, uh, publication about that. So uh, in, in some situations, you do have a 3D pre-op image, right? But then you want to know uh, where this 3D uh, anatomy is during uh, the procedure. During the procedure, you don't necessarily have 3D imaging. Uh, in most procedures, you don't. You only have uh, a C-arm or, or, uh, and you're only seeing uh, uh, particular projections of the anatomy. Uh, so how to uh, fuse those two uh, modalities, the preoperative imaging and the intraoperative imaging. Uh, and again, this can be in ortho, usually it's bones. And, and these are uh, a number of rigid structures that are maybe changing uh, their orientation or being modified and you need to find them. As I mentioned, uh, uh, in the uh, soft tissue field, this is a, a much more uh, challenging problem. Uh, that we're, the, of course, not the only ones trying to tackle it, but uh, it, it's also uh, an opportunity to use AI to do uh, things that, that have not been possible in the past. It's time for the Luminary Minute, a segment where Photonics Media looks back at a pivotal figure in the history of optical and photonic science. This episode, we'll be exploring the life of Arthur Shallow, a seminal figure in the field of laser science. Born in Mount Vernon, New York in 1921, Shallow is credited as a co-inventor of the laser, along with his postdoctoral advisor and later brother-in-law, Charles Hardtowns. It was Shallow's idea to utilize two mirrors as the resonant cavity to bring the wavelength from the microwave into the visible spectrum. Shallow and Towns published their patent in 1958, although the first working laser would not be constructed until 1960 by Theodore Maiman. In 1961, Shallow became a professor at Stanford University, having previously worked at Bell Labs from 1951. Shallow's research focused on optics, and in 1981, he, along with Nicholas Blombergen and Kai Siegbahn, received the Nobel Prize in Physics for contributions to the development of laser spectroscopy. You'll be advised to pay close attention to our interview with Johns Hopkins University's Dr. Russell Taylor. His view on surgical robotics is as well-informed, comprehensive, and encompassing as anyone's. While at IBM Research, Dr. Taylor invented the AML robot language and later managed the computer-assisted surgery group. In 2020, Dr. Taylor was elected to the National Academy of Engineering for contributions to the development of medical robotics in computer-integrated systems. He is also a recipient of four IBM Outstanding Achievement Awards. More than an expert in the field, Dr. Taylor is also a collaborator. His insights into how the field of surgical robotics has surged and why are influenced by advances in photonic imaging modalities and an ability to continuously improve systems and techniques. We begin with a simple set of questions. How do you see the field and what limitations have engineers overcome to date? Perhaps I should just give a, a broader context of how I see surgical robotics. Basically, uh, we're seeing the systems that involve a three-way partnership between people, caregivers, physicians, technology, robots, uh, photonic devices, sensors, or the like, and uh, information to improve treatment processes. And that can either be done retail by improving the intervention for in some way for an individual patient, more accurate, safer, more efficacious, whatever, but also because you are using all of this information and eventually you know the outcome, I can put those together and use machine learning techniques to uh, improve my treatment processes for future patients. And it really is that synergy between the retail and the continuous improvement model 
that I think drives things and was on my mind from the beginning. Now, a couple of the limitations. Initially, I think people were, were primarily driven by two sorts of limitations. One set had to do with the accuracy of, of an intervention, the ability to place a tool very accurately on some target that you had identified, usually in some kind of a medical image, like a CT image or a MRI image, or to do something with very high accuracy. And the other limitation uh, that drove a lot of the early development was the necessity of reducing the invasiveness of a surgical procedure, uh, the ability to reach what are effectively your large hands, get them in miniaturized and operating from inside the patient's body with very small holes. For the accuracy, uh, there were earliest uses of robots were for replacing what are called stereotactic frames. In other words, basically for guiding a needle to hit a target, for instance, in the brain or uh, in some other part of the body that you've identified on a medical image or to very accurately machine uh, a bone for, for hip replacement surgery, which was my first application. The minimally invasive was really driven by the emergence of laparoscopic surgery as a brand new technique that was explosively being advanced, but that there were many technical difficulties for surgeons to do it. And the solutions uh, had to do with basically robots that would first manipulate endoscopes and then shortly after manipulate surgical tools uh, inside the patient's body under remote control by a surgeon. Throughout our interview, we place Dr. Taylor at the fore of the field of surgical robotics. It's an appropriate placement for a scientist with more than four decades of pertinent and leading contributions, but innovation comes from multiple people and from many different places. For Taylor, the formation of one team led to the creation of multiple. One solution segued into another, and the path to commercialization opened doors that have not yet closed since before he arrived at Johns Hopkins in the mid-90s. You certainly have been on the front lines for quite some time. Uh, in terms of personnel, who are we talking about? My own initial involvement was uh, we were approached at IBM. I was a middle manager at IBM Research, and we had been approached by some surgeons at UC Davis who were interested in preparing uh, the bone for cementless hip replacement surgery to improve the, the fit of, of the implant into the bone and place it where they wanted it. And uh, I was, at the time, I was a middle manager. I got very interested in this and was wanted to take a break from personnel meetings and budget meetings most of my time. And uh, so I, I, I formed a, a small team to develop that application and a couple other applications. Another was a way of helping surgeons do craniofacial surgery. And so in that sense, the we was the team at IBM that I, I, I led that developed this system that was then spun off and commercialized. In terms of the minimally invasive surgery, I, I got interested in that about the time some other people did when I was asked to give a uh, talk at uh, SAGES, which is the endoscopic surgeons meeting, where suddenly there were, we were, I was told there would be 25 people there, there were 500 largely because laparoscopic surgery was exploding. And I realized there were some real opportunities. So we went back, we being my team, went back and developed a, a prototype system that had some of the, many of the ideas that are now used in the da Vinci robot. But at the same time, uh, concurrently, there were, were groups at SRI and a couple other places who were developing prototype robots specifically for laparoscopic surgery. And uh, there was two companies initially. One was a company called Computer Motion, and the other was a company called Intuitive Surgery Surgical, uh, who eventually, who are the company that developed the da Vinci robots. That company, uh, some years later, actually acquired Computer Motion really became, uh, it was their success that really, I think, drove broadly the field. There was a time when there were probably five and then maybe 20 people actively working 
broadly in, in this area of robotic surgery. And now, you know, there are many thousands. We asked Dr. Taylor about the evolution of surgical robotics. It was apparent once again that progress is to be gauged cohesively, though with factors jutting out from a great many directions. As systems become more sophisticated, their usability increases, as does their adoption. I think from the very beginning, we had this notion that you could incorporate sensing and feedback to the surgeon and make a real partnership with the surgeon. But the technical barriers to do that are immense. And uh, I think, uh, let, let's take photonics as an example. If you had, when you began to have robotic systems like the da Vinci, you could display information to the physician that you're getting from sensors, from ultrasound, from uh, these infrared light fluorescence sensors, and, and other information. And very quickly, physicians found real advantages there. And so I, I think there's this sort of virtuous cycle there. And as systems are becoming um, more, more and more sophisticated, we're seeing more of that. I, I think one thing that did surprise me a little bit was how quickly what's now referred to as the AI revolution actually took off after some capability threshold was passed. There's a long way to go, especially with there are real limitations with these current machine learning systems that really need to be understood much better. But you get to a point where there's a threshold and suddenly something is possible and then suddenly that possibility is, begins to be exploited in many ways. And I, I think we're seeing that. If we're looking at, again, let me talk about photonics, your photonics publication. Another thing that I think we always thought about from the beginning and has really been delightful to see finally really beginning to take off are incorporation of photonic methods into surgical tools. And again, our research group at Johns Hopkins has been doing a lot of that work, as have others. Uh, one simple example has been building uh, optical fiber force sensors into submillimetric uh, surgical tools for ophthalmology. But also, uh, you can use uh, things like build a very small OCT system into the end of a into a surgical tool, and it can see basically the tissue right beyond where it's about to cut. And, and uh, that can be built into a handheld tool. Our group hasn't been so involved with confocal microscopy, where one of the kind of uses is you can do, you can do basically an optical biopsy of a tumor bed as you're resecting it. A third area of a sort of smart instrumentation or robot-assisted sensing has had to do with photoacoustic ultrasound where basically it's lightning and thunder, as I believe your audience would know, where uh, you flash a, a flash of uh, light and the tissue expands just enough to give off acoustic energy, which an ultrasound sensor can sense. And doing that, uh, you can often visualize anatomy or by changing the spectrum of the light, you can see different things, including even things like nerve activity. I want to end by tying together this circle that we began to trace, and I speak in conversation time, decades ago. You know, this field that you've helped to pioneer isn't static, is it? Where are we in terms of trends in vision-guided robot-assisted surgery? We're clearly seeing a push to make these machines more, quote, intelligent, whatever that means. This trend I mentioned in the partnership from moving from I will drive the machine. In any case, what you need to do is tell the machine what to do and be sure the machine will do that and not something else. But as you're able to tell the machine, rather than just move your tool like my control handle is moving, tell it, please scan this piece of anatomy or, or things like that, where then you're using your own real-time sensors to do, do something uh, advantageous to the surgeon. I think that is beginning really to take off. So that's one of the areas. I think another area that we're going to see more and more are uh, flexible endoscopy systems are going to become much more sophisticated and much more mini miniaturized, and that will enable minimally invasive interventions 
and parts of the body which right now are, are difficult to do. Uh, for instance, in spine surgery, the robots today basically hold a guide so you can drill a hole and put a screw in, in the pedicle of a vertebra. That's the little strut between the front part of the vertebra and the back part. But if you want to get at the disc space and work around, say, a nerve root, you require higher dexterity. And so improvements in the mechanics for that or in things like flexible endo endoscopes for the lungs or the uh, GI tract, you're going to see more and more miniaturized ability to do very precise things locally in those areas. And again, coming back to photonics, I think in some of those cases, people already recognize uh, there's a big opportunity, uh, for instance, in, in GI endoscopy, especially to do uh, confocal microscopy to uh, look for cancerous lesions in situ, or ways that you can use photonic techniques to, to help you dissect mucosa, you know, the, the, the membranes down inside the intestines at the end of a flexible endoscope with miniaturized tools. I think you're going to see evolution to greater precision more and more in microsurgery, which is another area we're working in, more and more integration with real-time imaging from multiple sources. I suppose we've crossed the threshold. This is a photonics podcast, and we've hit now on several of the buzzwords, OCT, confocal microscopy, photoacoustic imaging. I'm going to spare you the pun, but why light? Light has a lot of advantages, especially with optical fibers. You can put it different places. The technology usually doesn't care about ionizing radiation so much, uh, both for sterility, and you can put it places. You can, you can miniaturize this, and you can see at, at exquisite detail beyond beyond the surface. And if you're trying to do things kind of locally, that, that can be really important. And I think one of the other things that really did surprise me was um, the potential for using uh, photoacoustic methods much deeper into the anatomy than I had originally thought would be possible. And uh, that's probably more a tribute to my naivety about infrared light and my colleagues understanding of that and reassuring me yes they can do that as anything else that concludes this week's episode of all things photonics thank you to our engineer alan shepherd and to our news editor jake saltzman as well as to this week's sponsors our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com most of all thank you our listeners as always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthingsphotonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com. <laughs>